So the pastor is away. But did you know that God has people? Did you know that? God has people everywhere in southern Rhode Island, northern Rhode Island, other states. God has people. So when we don't have a pastor, we look for a people. And we're very pleased to have Matt and Alice Henderson here with us this morning, who are no strangers to our ministry here at Perryville Bible Church. He has uh, ministered to us before, and uh, we're just very glad to have them here. So, Matt, why don't you come and share with us what God has laid on your heart as one of those people. So. Well, good morning. Good morning. It is a blessing to be here with you this morning. Uh, we'll be in Colossians chapter 1, and um, if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to turn there uh, so we won't have all of the verses on the, on the screen. Uh, as you're turning there, I, I want you to know that my aim today is uh, that we will walk away uh, in worship and in awe, uh, not because uh, of what I communicate or how I communicate, uh, certainly it won't be that. I'm not an eloquent uh, speaker. Um, it won't be because of a certain song that we really like, although um, that was a great song. I love um, that song. But I, but I hope that we will walk away in worship and awe because of Jesus. Um, perhaps you came uh, this morning with a, a heavy burden that's dragging you down. Uh, or maybe you're distracted by all the stuff that uh, you need to get accomplished this week, or maybe accomplished before Christmas. But my prayer is that because of this passage, that, that we will set our minds on Jesus Christ this morning, that, that we will think on these things, the things that are true, that which is honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, and worthy of praise, as Paul says in Philippians 4.8. Because that is who Jesus is. And my aim is, is that we will walk away from here today not just thinking about Jesus in a head knowledge sort of way, um, but that we will be able to see how He impacts our daily lives. We want to be doers of the Word, um, not just hearers deceiving ourselves. Uh, James chapter 1 says that, that we can tend to be like a, a person who stares intently at, the, at our own face in the mirror. And when we walk away, we instantly forget what we look like. And in that same way, uh, how many of us leave the church building and, and immediately forget what we've heard? How many of us, or how many times do, do we hear the application and we think about it and then we will walk away and forget and never apply it? So this morning, my aim and my prayer is that we will see Jesus as preeminent and that his preeminence will affect our daily lives. So right now, there, there are multitudes of people all around the world uh, who, are, who are thinking about Jesus in um, various ways and, uh, because of the Christmas holiday season. Um, they hear the Christmas carols. They uh, see the nativity scenes. Um, in, in various places. Uh, perhaps they even came to the tableau um, last week. But who is Christ that, who was born in that manger in Bethlehem? I remember hearing a, a sermon about 20 years ago uh, from a church I was visiting, and uh, the preacher focused on the fact that, that Jesus was a baby. And while it's fascinating to think uh, of Jesus being born and uh, being a, a baby, uh, the, the sermon actually became merely a, a message about how great babies are. And um, the application was that we should care for the little ones. And while that's true, that's totally missing the point of the incarnation. Who is this Jesus whose birth we celebrate and I think this passage in Colossians really helps us get there, right? Um, so let's look at our passage, Colossians chapter 1. And this, when we read through this the, the first time, it may sound a little academic or, or theoretical at, at first, um, something that, that has no real meaning for our everyday life. Uh, 
but it does. So, so hang in there with me. Um, we'll come back to uh, verses 13 and 14, uh, but let's start at verse 15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus makes the invisible visible. Uh, if we want to know what God is like, uh, what God the Father is like, look to Jesus. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Hebrews 1.3 says that, that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So he's not just like God, he is God in human flesh. And the last part of that, that verse states, he is the firstborn of all creation. Now, some t- t- try to take this verse and, and twist it to mean that, that Jesus was a created being. Um, but that would mean that, that he isn't God, right? Um, what, was there ever a time when Jesus did not exist? No, as we'll see in a minute from this passage, Jesus wasn't a created being, and, and he wasn't actually the, the first to ever be born since for thousands of years. Before his birth in Bethlehem, people had been born before him. So what does it mean, the firstborn of all creation? Um, Think about what the firstborn meant in the Old Testament. To the Old Testament readers, that's so helpful for us as we interpret this passage. Um, Just do a a word search online if you have a Bible app or something. Do a a word search sometime for firstborn, and, and you'll see uh, the, the numerous examples. Um, the, the firstborn was, was the most honored and the, the most important uh, because the firstborn had the rights to the inheritance. So Jesus is the firstborn in terms of rank or position. Um, it, it, he is the first in importance. So look at, look at verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven's in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So first of all, this shows us that, that Jesus was around before his birth in Bethlehem, right? Um, in the beginning was the word, as, as John chapter 1 states, and the word there is referred, uh, referring to Jesus Christ. He had already existed in the beginning he, and, and was, in fact, the, the one who created all things. Doesn't that blow your mind? We, we, we can't uh, imagine before there was time, um, before creation. We can't fathom that. But before all of that, God existed. And he existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit then, the triune God. By him, everything was created. The the earth, heaven, mankind, angels, everything. So what this tells us is that everything is his. Since he created everything, he also determines its purpose and its meaning. I just finished teaching through a six-week series with our our students at URI and and at CCRI, and the the series was on gender, sexuality, and the Bible. And we began that series looking at Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Why? For this exact reason. Because since God created us, He is the starting place for how we understand gender, sexuality, or anything else. Not our feelings our experiences, or our thoughts, all of those things that we tend to to let drive us, all of those things are subject to Him. So we we start with with what He has said through Scripture, that this is His purpose for uh, our lives, this is His design for our lives, and we realize that everything was created for Him. Our gender, our sexuality, our family, our work, the church, it's all for Him. When, when we try to make our, our lives about anything else, we end up missing the point. Romans 11.36 says, For from Him 
and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. That verse should cause us to to stop and recognize how much our, our lives how much of our lives we tend to make about ourselves. This should bring our focus and our our worship back to our Creator, God, whom everything is from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. Verse 16 should also give us confidence in Him uh, because as the Creator, He is uh, over all rulers and authorities, both human and in the, in the spiritual realm as well. As the psalmist writes in Psalm 27, whom shall I fear? If this is my God, the obvious answer in light of, of what we see is, I fear no one but my God. Verse seven, uh, or 17 says, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What does this tell us about Jesus? He's not only the creator, but the sustainer. Uh, Jesus is not a a distant God who created everything and then sits back uh, to just let everything happen on its own. Uh, Isn't that how the world views it? Uh, If they think that there is a God, uh, they say, well, you know, he just kind of set everything into motion. Um, But he's involved constantly. Um, nothing remains in existence except for his holding it together. Think about how chaotic the universe is in, in many ways. Um, how many times do we hear that, that, that something is going to come crashing into the earth from space and it's going to cause the total destruction of our planet? Every now and then you hear that uh, come across. Uh, some scientist has determined that our planet's coming to an end. Um, With all the stuff floating around in space, it certainly could and and probably would, except God holds everything together. If you think about how if anything in the universe gets out of line, anything slows down or speeds up, um, maybe slows down or speeds up the Earth's gravitational pull, we can't survive. But Jesus, who created all things, visible and invisible, he created gravity. Isn't that pretty amazing? He created uh, things that we can't even see or explain. He created the rotation of the planets. He set them into motion, and he sustains all of it every single moment of every single day. And the heavens declare the glory of God. As Psalm 19 says, he sustains every molecule, every bit of our being, every life, uh, every breath that we take. That's God sustaining us. And verse, verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus has authority over the church. It's, it, it was his idea. Uh, and, and the body is, is one of the most important images that we get here in the, uh, in the New Testament uh, for, the, for the church. Each Christian is a member of this spiritual body. We, we all have different functions, uh, just as, as the toe has a, a different f- function than the kidney. Uh, but we are all part of the body. Um, as, and the most important thing uh, that we need to realize is that Christ is the head. Um, can you function without your head? I've yet to see a person uh, who does. Uh, it, it's kind of important. Actually, it's essential. Uh, the, the head controls all the other parts. And, and this is good for us because it reminds us that uh, it, it's not another person that does that work. It's not a pastor or a denominational leader or um, anyone else, but but Jesus alone who is the head. And that keeps us from elevating someone else into that that position. So so he's the head of the church. He has full rights over the church because he is the firstborn of the dead. What does that mean? 
Well, others were, were raised uh, from the dead before him chronologically, right? Um, Elijah raised the, the widow's son in uh, 1 Kings 17. We could even say uh, Jesus raised Lazarus in uh, John 11. Jairus' daughter was raised in Mark 5. But what happened to all of those people eventually? They died again. <laughs> that really stinks, right? You die once and then you have to die again. Uh, but Jesus was the only one to conquer death. He was the, the, the first to, to rise in, a, in an eternal body. And he did this uh, so that it would be clear that he is preeminent. Um, preeminence is, is the word that um, the ESV uses, the, the text that, I, that I'm using. Um, I, I, it's a word that we don't often use, um, but, it, but it means surpassing all others, uh, being superior or supreme, I think, as um, the, the text that was read earlier said, having the, the highest rank or the highest importance. So Christ's death and resurrection displays his preeminence in in a way that that no one else can claim. No one else can can claim that. He he conquered the enemy of death that no one else has conquered and that no one else can conquer. The the Apostle Paul wrote wrote this letter to the Colossian church uh, to uh, combat false teaching about Jesus. And and obviously, it it was a lot of the same of of what we see in our world today, uh, that Jesus was just another man. Um, Maybe he was a great man, um, a a teacher, some say a good teacher, a moral person, a motivator who could gather a following. Essentially, he gets equal billing with everyone else, every other um, human being that, that we hold in esteem in human history. Uh, Many will allow Jesus a prominent place, but refusing to acknowledge that He is preeminent, that He is supreme. When we read all of Scripture, including this passage right here, it becomes clear that Jesus is preeminent. He is the one who Scripture is ultimately about. Everything points to Him. What about our lives? Is, Is Jesus preeminent in your life today. Uh, I've heard an illustration that many s- p- people kind of see their, their lives as, as a pie, and, and their family is a slice of the pie, another is their job, uh, perhaps another is uh, the school, um, yet Jesus is another slice of the pie, or the spiritual aspect of the pie. And we can tend to see life in this way, um, and we may think that as long as Jesus is a decent portion of that pie in our life, then he's happy with that. Because, of course, there are are multitudes of people who wouldn't even include him as a slice of the pie. Perhaps we rationalize it by, by saying Jesus is our priority. He gets the first slice. But here's the problem. If Jesus is just our priority, if he's just one piece of our life, then we can go through all of the other slices of our life living as we choose. But if Jesus is preeminent, he has the highest importance, not just in the spiritual part of our life, not just at church or at Bible study, but in all of life. He's the creator of all things, and he is over all things, and our life should be lived for his glory. Verse 19 says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This doesn't mean that that there was a point in in which the, the fullness of God didn't dwell in him, as if at one point Jesus was just a man. He he's eternally God and, and fully God. He lacks nothing. Many have, have pointed to the, the meaning of this fullness as the sum total of all the divine power and attributes. It means completeness. He is all God, fully God. In verse 20, 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. When you think of the, the word reconcile, uh, you, you might think of it in terms of uh, a couple who is separated and uh, maybe in the, in the process of divorcing, but the, their relationship is reconciled, it's put back together. They've reconciled. Jesus has the authority to reconcile and restore our relationship with God. That relationship was broken because of our sin. Why would the God who created everything and is over everything, why would he willingly come to earth humbly born in a manger? Because he cares about his people. He cares about his church. Some of us may in our pride think, of course he would love me. Of course he would do anything for me. But we think too highly of ourselves. And we think that that we are actually lovable. We forget verse 21. As that verse, verse states, apart from Christ, we are alienated from our Creator God. We are hostile in mind toward God. Romans 5 says that, that we, are, we were at war with God. We are enemies of God. But Jesus has brought peace. It's also important that this passage emphasizes the divinity of Jesus because He reconciled us to Himself as God. Um, No one else could bring that that kind of peace. No other human being. Looking back uh, quickly at verses 13 and 14, we see that that we have been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness. This is what he's done. And, And here's the thing. We couldn't even recognize that this is our state if it weren't for for Jesus. Uh, Have you ever sat in in a dark room where uh, you didn't even realize that it it was dark? Um, And and then someone comes in and says, how can you read in here? It's so dark. Uh, Or or how can you see anything in here? And then they, they flip on the light and you're like, oh wow, I didn't even realize how dark it had gotten. You know, perhaps like when the sun is going down and and you you just keep reading or you keep doing what you're doing and it gets dark. Didn't recognize that it had gotten so dark. But contrasted with the light, it becomes clear. Uh, When we're walking in sin and we're walking in darkness, um, we need God to intervene, to show us the light. Uh, Not only did he show us the way... It says he transferred us into a new kingdom. Because of Jesus, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The the preeminent one purchased sinners like you and me, those who were enemies of him. And he canceled our debt, nailing it to the cross. Isn't that amazing? Why would Jesus come for us? Here's why he came. This is why he would humble himself, take on flesh, be born in a manger. We couldn't reconcile ourselves. We had no other option, no other hope. You may ask, so what do we do? Surely I've got to do something. Um, How can I be transferred out of this darkness? How how can I have peace with, with God and have a relationship with him. Uh, let me ask you something, friend. Do you believe that Jesus is preeminent? If something or someone else is preeminent in our life, we're headed for disaster. I, I tell students who are letting academics uh, become their end all be all um, that they're headed for a collision. Uh, because uh, should the day come where, where they don't reach their desired goal, Maybe um, something keeps them from graduating or getting that job that they long desired. They're going to feel like their purpose is gone. Uh, an athlete who, who puts their sport as preeminent in their life, 
Um, they're headed for disaster. Uh, once an injury comes that, that wrecks their career, they lose their, their purpose in life. Where will they find it? A person who puts their career as, a, as preeminent loses hope and meaning if they get laid off of the job. We, we try to, to put all kinds of other things in the place that Jesus alone is meant to fill. So what needs to change in your life so that Jesus is preeminent today? Do you see His greatness? Do you see who He is? Do you believe that His sacrifice on the cross is enough to, to pay what you owe because of your sin? Do you trust Him with your life? If, if so, John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on them. Trust Him today. Place your faith in Him. That's what He calls you and I to do. And then keep believing. I love the the Apostle Paul's prayer for the Colossian church um, here in verses 9 through 12. Look at this. I I think it, it shows us like this, this is what he's praying for the Colossian church, but this is what a life looks like who sees Jesus as surpassing all others. I see six things here. One, a life that sees Jesus as superior will be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We won't be sitting around wondering, what's God's will for my life? I have no idea. No, we, we know why we exist. We exist for His glory. We exist to live for Him. Secondly, we'll, we'll walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. After all, He, he has reconciled us um, in order, He says here, to, to present us holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. How could we continue to indulge in the sins for which Christ died. So we will walk, uh, if we see Jesus as supreme, we'll walk in a manner that is pleasing to Him. Third, we'll bear fruit in every good work, according to verse 6. That sounds like the, the fruit has a lot to do with the gospel going forth throughout the world. So we'll be sharing the gospel. We'll be making disciples. If Jesus is above all else in our life, then how could we not tell others about Him? How could we keep it to ourselves? Fourth, we'll be increasing in, um, increasing, increasing in the knowledge of God. We'll want to know Him more. We'll want His Word to dwell in us richly, as chapter 3, verse 16 says. When when we see Him for who He is, we won't be content with lesser things. So we'll want to know Him more, grow closer to Him. Fifth, uh, we will be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. We'll persevere in the faith, remaining stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that we have heard. If we see him as preeminent, we will persevere. And finally, six, we'll give thanks to God, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. How could we not give thanks? To recognize that we were once his enemies that we were once hostile in mind. But He's offered us life. Life with Him. Life eternal and given us an inheritance in Christ. How could we not give thanks? If, If Jesus is preeminent, this should be characteristic of our life. What needs to change today in your life, in my life, so that Jesus is supreme. I I pray that each and every one of us 
uh, will know him and trust him today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the, this passage. Thank you for the reminder of why you sent your Son, why you have, have come um, to, uh, to dwell with us. We were without hope. We had no other option. But Lord, we thank you that Jesus, the, the creator of all things, supreme over all things, that you care about us and that you stepped in and have intervened. Lord, we do pray that we would not go through uh, this season, this Christmas season, um, taking this lightly, but I pray that um, it would go beyond that, that as we go throughout our life, Lord, that everything that we do, that it would be for you and for your glory. Lord, that um, we would desire to know you more, that we would desire to walk in a manner that is worthy of you, that we would desire to make you known on this earth. So, Lord, help us. Help us to, um, to gaze at your, your beauty, majesty, holiness, glory. And, Lord, may we be transformed today. May our lives be changed because we have encountered you. We've seen who you are. Let us not walk away from here unchanged, Lord. Use us for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.